I love Winnipeg, especially this time of year. This is the only day in the year I wake up feeling rested. <laughs> Same to me. <laughs> so who um, has ever done a pen test? Who's ever been on the other side of a pen test? Who knows what the MITRE ATT&CK framework is? Yay, hey, hands, great. So um, I have done this presentation a few times with my friend and colleague, Daniel, who wants to do it? Wiley Zickstern. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't convince him to come to Winnipeg, Aww. so he's dead to us. <laughs> um, I am on the security team at Priceline, the travel company. We have a great office here in Winnipeg where we're hiring developers. We're also part of a holding company. Um, so what we've done here, we've also done at companies like Booking.com, Kayak, OpenTable, Agoda. So I've seen this play out in a few different programs and a few different environments. Um, in security, we've got it great because there's a lot of money rolling around. When I go to my boss and say we need to do something, I at least get listened to. I often get funded. And year over year, I think everyone's budget's going up. But we don't have a great way of demonstrating that the money we're spending is going somewhere and that it's producing a measurable improvement in our programs. A lot of what we do is through adversarial testing. And much like Mike said yesterday, pen testing is broken. And the reason it's broken is a few of them. But mostly, we keep doing the same thing over and over again. And it's a cycle of self-flagellation <laughs> that doesn't actually make improvements that we can measure. So I get to represent both the adversarial tester, tester's point of view as well as the blue team's point of view today, which is fun. I've never been a pen tester, but I've talked to a few. My, my impression is the first year you're doing it, you love it. Because every week, you go into a new environment. You walk all over the network, you get DA, you bypass their EDR, and it's awesome. The second year, you're going back to the same clients and you're doing it all again, and you start to get this feeling when your shell from a year ago reconnects to you <laughs> that maybe there's a better way of doing this. And, and maybe by the third year, you start thinking and getting a little depressed and thinking you're not really making an improvement at your clients. Um, part of the reason is we're not good at measuring this, right? we don't know what good looks like year over year over year. Uh, another reason is, and as someone on the blue team, on the security team, I've done this. You go to your testers and you say, well, we would have picked you up. Please note in your report how good our detections are. Right? Give us some credit here. My boss is going to read this. And I've been told, pen testers hear that every week and they get sick of it. From our perspective, we didn't love it either, right? We've, we've gone through years of pen testing and red teaming. And first of all, it, it pisses me off when we get repeat findings. We read every report and we address every finding and sometime in the next 12 months, something regressed and showed back up. And more importantly, the testing cycle kind of stinks because you come in, you test our environment for two or three weeks, you take a week to write a report, you send it to me, I'm traveling, I get back, I actually read the report. It's been a month since you started testing, and we've forgotten what detections fired when. Maybe some of our logs have rolled over. A and at that point, it's hard for us to make the improvements and the recommendations that you're asking for be because we need to repeat the activities you did. And we're smart guys, right? We, we know how to do that, but we might not do it the exact way that the pen testers did. It'd be great if we could repeat their tests exactly without calling them back in for a retest or a re-engagement in, in a way that we can do as much as we want, right? An all-you-can-eat model. So there is a US fu government-funded nonprofit called MITRE that's thought a lot about adversarial tactics and created something called the MITRE attack framework. And it looks like a big um, periodic table, right? And along the top, are your primary adversarial tactics. Well, what does the bad guy want to do from getting into your environment and moving through? And arrayed vertically are all of the techniques. There's 260 of them as of a week ago. Um, over the next quarter, they're reworking it so that some of the techniques become sub-techniques. But it attempts to be a comprehensive taxonomy 
of a, what attackers do in your network to compromise it. The tactics you can think of very similar to the kill chain, right? They need to enumerate, they need to get persistence, they need to elevate privileges, they need to establish C2, they need to exfiltrate data. And then the techniques, the, the, the columns, right, can get very granular about every technique that an adversarial group has been observed doing in the wild. Some of these are simple, some of these are complicated, some of these are used by many groups, some are constrained, some apply to many environments, some are restricted to Windows. This grew up as a Windows framework, it now covers Mac and Linux and mobile, uh, but you can see its origins when it gets deep in, you know, domain controller attacks. Each TTP, I'll call it, each technique, is mapped to the groups that are known to do it. There are examples of the tools they use to do it, so Mimikatz would show up on there. And there are suggested remediations. MITRE publishes what they call a navigator, which is uh, just a JS app, that you can enable and disable certain fields based on what you know about your adversary. This takes it from 260 different TTPs to just the ones you care about. So we wanted to use attack for several reasons. From the adversarial side, when I'm over here, right, it's something that could be repeatable and defensible. And when I say, oh, you should mention our good detection, well, maybe we didn't have that good of a detection, right? It's really great for the testers on a re-engagement and a re-engagement, and when the engagements have a better cadence than once a year, to demonstrate where you're doing well, where you've regressed, and what's changed in your program. From our perspective on the blue team, right, it lets us compare ourselves to our peers across the organization. It's a great way for us to talk to our vendors and say, look, you're our EDR. We expect you to detect this very specific thing on this very specific endpoint. Let's all agree this is what it's called. This is its TTP number. Here is a test script that someone performed that should generate it and regenerate it. Why aren't you um, alerting on this for us? It lets us take that giant list of 260 potential attacks and narrow it down to the ones we care about and then make a burn down list that we can say, okay, we've got this one covered in this environment, we've got this one covered in this environment. It's a way to chunk up the work and show coverage improving on a daily and weekly basis and not waiting until the next year when the red team comes back. Um, so what we've done is we've done what we call purple team exercises. This is where we bring in the third party adversarial testers into our house, sit them in a room with my team. Because we are a somewhat small security team, that means we're all generalists. And to me, a security generalist is going to lean blue. We get the third party adversarial testers in the room with our security team. We identify what we want to test and we work through the framework one at a time with the red team and the blue team together owning both the testing and the alerting. I'll show some alerts later and I don't know whether they were written by my team or by the adversarial testers we brought in. We've done, I think, four rounds of purple teaming now. The initial rounds were mostly about establishing coverage. Do we have the right telemetry? Are we getting the right reporting from the right devices? And as we've progressed, we've been able to get from the telemetry to detecting regressions to how do we enhance our coverage? What additional tooling do we need in this environment to collect more intelligence from our endpoints? Any red team pen test has constraints on it. And the constraints are sometimes aligned with the actual adversaries. And sometimes those constraints are different. A and when we go into this process, we need to be mindful of the constraints that exist. We need to enumerate those. And we need to understand if it's going to help our program or if it's something that's going to hinder the testing and produce a negative result. So the first constraint of any you know, adversarial testing you're paying for is time. We get the adversarial testers in for a week, two weeks. Um, each one of these is a different MITRE ATT&CK TTP that identifies a specific technique. T1030 is data transfer limits, right? It speaks to a low and slow data exfiltration. Over the course of a week, that's not something we're going to prioritize testing because it, it, we just don't have the capability for it. Um, the next T1205, anyone? You don't have these memorized? So that, that's port knocking. Anyone know what port knocking is? 
It's something neckbeards did 15 years ago to identify themselves on a network. It's not something that the adversaries we've identified targeting online travel are going to do. So this is something else we drop because it's not in our threat model. And, and finally, capabilities. If it's something that we know we're not going to allow the adversarial testers to do, uh, 1207 is uh, DC Shadow. Or if it's something we know we are just not going to pick up and we need to improve telemetry before then, we're flexible and we drop that and we move on. So Praetorian, who has done this third party testing where he who shall not be named works, um, has written a large number of MITRE attack TTPs, about 50 of them, into test cases that run in Metasploit. Those are all online on their GitHub. You don't have to use Metasploit. MITRE who make the attack framework have a tool called Caldera that has a very similar approach. There are commercial tools like Red Canary or Attack IQ that can make the attacks bite-sized, can replay them through your environment, and can catch a regression or you know, a, a new technique that you hadn't considered. Why did they choose Metasploit? A and Daniel and I gave this presentation in 35 minutes, and we gave it in 30 minutes. I've not done it in 20 minutes, so I've, I've carved a bunch out here. See how I'm doing? Oh yeah, we're fine. So <laughs> why'd they choose Metasploit? Because um, it's everywhere, I it's easy to use, and it's repeatable. Most people at least have a Kali box laying around, right? And it's got a great development backing. Some of the problems with Metasploit, first of all, it's hard to whitelist the payload. Um, our EDR will fire on it even if we put the hash directly in based on what it's doing. And uh, this is my problem, not theirs. If, if I touch Metasploit once or twice a year, it, I'm coming in from zero. And it's really hard for me to come back into that if it's not something I'm working in every day. Uh, that's why some people will go for the uh, commercial tooling. Here are ex examples of the actual TTPs that Praetorian have produced and, and that you can replay in your environment. Uh, at Priceline, we're pretty maniacal about how we do monitoring and alerting. and We have a very strict um, formatting for our alerting. They are the same about these tests. Each one is going to perform reliably. It's going to pop calc. It's going to write a file. When you run these, you know what's going to happen, and you can tell if it's successfully completed or not. I mentioned that we're um, maniacal about detections. The most important thing to come out of the purple team is an improvement to our detection suite. And when we think about this, because we're a small team and we're an engineering-led team, we're not an operations team, we want detections that we can consume anywhere that will be instantly understandable as to what's happening and, and that we can dismiss as quickly as possible and move on. The way we accomplish this is almost all of our telemetry throws in, flows into our SIM. Almost all of those alerts will fire out to Slack. We can get Slack anywhere. Every alert's got to have a kind of cool and distinct emoji um, so that you can instantly recognize what's going on. Um, it's a shared responsibility. We don't have an on-call matrix. Everyone is expected to look at it most of the time. Um, on the weekends, that means me. Um, when somebody looks at it, you give it a check mark and everyone knows to move on. If it's something that requires further investigation, you can start a thread underneath it in Slack. Every alert like this will have a link to the underlying telemetry. Every alert like this has a spreadsheet behind it that identifies all of the MITRE ATT&CK TTPs associated with it, all known false positives, all known false negatives. It'll let you know the context of the alert when it was created, so that if you're coming into this blind, you can kind of understand what's going on. Anyone used a line like this on their boss before? Oh, my job is so hard. <laughs> if I do my job right, you never hear from me. <laughs> if I mess up just once, the bad guys get in and steal everything. Uh, that's kind of not true. I've certainly used it a million times, right? Uh, it, it gets a lot of sympathy, um, but <laughs> it, it, it's not true, right? Because we attackers think in chains, we think in chains, right? It's, it's the kill chain model. And you don't need a cat on every stair. These are Daniel's cats. If you line the cats up smartly, they'll trip you with only two or three of them. <laughs> so at, at Priceline and at the holding company, we think of, we, we call this attack path mapping, right? It's a take on um, the kill chain and it uses MITRE ATT&CK. 
It thinks about our network and what we prioritize, and it shows sort of the complete path through the network. And using that visualization, it lets us understand where we have and where we need telemetry detections and alerting. Ah, doing great. Um, attack is great, but it's not enough. Um, it didn't consider cloud until a week ago. It's not strong on applications, right? You need to have something else to think about that. A and it's just a framework. I it's not regulation, right? It's not being imposed. If it helps us, and if it lets us make things better, we use it. If it doesn't, we do something else and move on. The pen testers, red teamers, purple teamers we've worked with absolutely love to send us a PDF and then walk away. And the PDF's not useful. I think everyone knows that. The, the way that we've done it in these purple team exercises is Praetorian produces this massive spreadsheet for us. The, the, span, the fans on my laptop spin up as soon as I open it. But it's a complete representation of MITRE ATT&CK. And for every cell, there's a technique. And through coloration and other scoring, we can understand if we prioritized it and how our capabilities are across all of our different environments. It's a much better way of consuming information about how we respond to adversarial attacks than a PDF that's 88 pages, most of which is copy and pasted out of burp. So, uh, that's not Daniel's camp. Um, so what was my perspective in going through several iterations of purple teaming? Um, in my remaining three minutes, the only thing you need to know, communication is the most important thing. Communication before you start, talking to the adversarial testers, establishing goals and scope and everything else, letting the internal teams know what's happening and where it's happening and why it's happening, and then communicating with the security team to understand what are we prioritizing this time, we're two days in, what isn't working, what do we do next? The, the people, so yesterday, um, who was it, Rich maybe, talked about uh, carbon-based IDSs. Um, being, you know, the whole company is in the security team. We're, we're a small part of the company, and we need to deputize everyone when we do this. That's, that's why we stress communication so much, a and that's why we let people know what's happening, and we let them know the room we'll be in, and we schedule office hours, and we have them come do drop in and show them a demo of what's happening, so they understand why we're doing this, right? Um, when, <laughs> skipping ahead, because time's almost out, right? Um, when the test is done, we expect a taxonomized result of here are the techniques that were attempted. Here's where we did well. Here's where we need to follow up. Here is the test cases we have. Here are the test cases we need to build. Here is our matrix of alerts we've created. Here's what's covered based on um, MITRE ATT&CK TTPs. And here's what's left. That's the tactical stuff. As soon as the exercise is done, we start taking notes about what we want to do differently next time. Uh, on the strategic side, the outcome of these reports really helps us. That's not stressful at all, <laughs> <laughs> um, On the strategic side, right, the outcome of these reports lets us change our approach. As an example, I, I had been very skeptical of, of the value of pulling in bash history from production for years. Um, because among all the things we can do, it was more expensive to build and it was less likely to be used. Once we had gone through MITRE ATT&CK, we looked at the threat actors we cared about. We looked at the TTPs and the suggested mitigations. We, I, changed our mind, right? And we reprioritized what we were bringing in. Everything we do falls back into the spreadsheet Everything is taxonomized and prioritized. We, when an attack runs, when an alert runs, we understand the context it's happening in. When someone new joins the team, like happened two or three weeks ago, they immediately have a better understanding of what's happening and why. This is almost the end. Um, tips for success, again, communication, understanding your priorities up front, knowing what you want to achieve, being flexible to change it around, and, and most importantly, the whole team can't look like me, right? If everyone on the red team and everyone on the blue team is a 44-year-old who's been in security for 20 years, you're going to get shit results, 
right? You need some variation on the team, people who have done different things and seen different things to understand what an adversary is actually going to do on your network. We're hiring developers in Winnipeg and across the holding company we need security people in Amsterdam, New York, Boston, uh, San Francisco, LA, and Bangkok and talk to any of us about that. Thanks.